Hello and a warm welcome to another edition of To The Point. On the show this week, a very special guest who's one of the technology titans from United States. He's been the chairman emeritus of the company Cisco and he's also currently the chairperson of the Indo-US Strategic Partnership Forum, which is a very significant forum when it comes to Indo-US ties. I welcome John Chambers on the program. Milu, it's a pleasure. And the concept of To The Point will be a lot of fun today. <laughs> John, my pleasure to have you on the program. And uh, to start with you, first of all, a very big congratulations for getting the highest civilian award from India. And were you expecting this? I was not. I, I was surprised. Suddenly during the middle of the night, my phone started vibrating. I keep it on vibrate, not sound. And there were a bunch of congratulations coming from my friends in India. And I was wondering, congratulations for what? So it was very much a surprise, a tremendous honor. Very humbled by it. Before we get into the larger contours of the program, I would really like to uh, ask you about your journey of life. You are known to be a person who converts the weaknesses into strengths. And you've traversed so many years in life. Uh, would want to know from you how your journey has been, where you began and where to where you've reached now. I will follow you with whatever questions along those lines. I started in West Virginia. Uh, my parents were both doctors. They taught me a lot about how to deal with opportunities and challenges. Uh, I was dyslexic, which means that I put uh, uh, sentences backwards and read backwards. And fortunately, I had a teacher, which is why I believe so much in education, uh, that taught me how to take that weakness and actually make it a strength. My parents were my best advisors in my life. My mom taught me the emotional connections and how to really connect. She was internal medicine, psychiatry, and my dad was OBGYN, delivered 6,000 babies, and he taught me how to deal with challenges in life and how to deal with the world the way it is, even to the point at one time when I was six years old and I fell into a river where we were fishing, and I got swept away in the rapids, and it was very dangerous. And uh, to this day, I can remember my dad from way up at the river yelling at me to hold on to the pole. He had told me not to get too close to the edge, but I did. And every time I was surfacing, I'd get my head above water. He'd yell, hold on to the pole. <laughs> it was an ugly fishing pole. It might have cost $5. But he kept me focused on the pole, and we went a couple hundred yards down the river, and he came down, swam out, and got me, pulled me in. And he set me down, as he's done so many times in life, and said, Whenever you find yourself in a very difficult situation, you cannot panic, you can't swim against the tide, you've got to realize how you got there and how do you get out. And then he took me upriver, which I know my mom didn't know, and he put me right back in the rabbits and let me learn how to do it myself. <laughs> Oddly enough, about 10 years later, a young man who was very similar to me, but that time he was about 16, and he drowned in that exact same spot because nobody was there to tell him to hold on to the pole, to really focus on not panicking and how do you adjust and how do you work your way over in tough situations to get to the side and realize how much you did yourself and how much was done to you. But John, what was the biggest turning point in your life when you look at the journey backwards now? I think the, uh, the biggest turning point was clearly education. Uh, my parents, we were from a state that at the time was very successful, West Virginia. We were the chemical center of the world, 6,000 engineers, Carbide, DuPont, FMC, coal center of the U.S., 125,000 miners. And I think it was clearly education. I went to school for nine and a half years uh, and married my high school sweetheart. She's put up with me all these years since then. But learning with a uh, business degree, uh, a law degree, and an MBA, how much education is the equalizer in life. And so I learned by watching transitions occur. West Virginia was in very good shape. More millionaires in West Virginia than in the United Kingdom. Average per capita income is extremely good. But because we didn't transition, we kept doing the same thing too long, we got left behind. And I love this state and I'm very proud of the people. I saw the same thing happen in Boston. 128 was the route around Boston, like 280 is Silicon Valley. And we were the high-tech center of the world. We couldn't even spell Silicon Valley. These are crazy Californians that didn't know what they were doing. And uh, yet, because we didn't switch from mainframes to mini computers, the PC to the internet, Boston got left behind. 106,000 people lost a job at DEC. 
32,000 people lost their job at Wang. So I've learned in life that you've got to either disrupt or you get disrupted, that when you see transitions occur, either technology or business model, you must transition with them or you get left behind. And I've learned to kind of what I say is connecting the dots, to see around corners perhaps from lessons learned of the past. So my growing up years, I was very fortunate, loving family, uh, parents who couldn't have been better and two wonderful sisters and a wonderful wife, and I got two great kids. It's really wonderful uh, the way you explained uh how uh, you know Boston got replaced with Silicon Valley yes. and you also spoke about uh, the loss of jobs now the only worry which uh, seems to be around the world is is about the job destruction yes. especially when you know because of the technology because of the digitization so many jobs are being lost so how do you really see the technology in war evolving in in the times to come well uh, in the sequence you raised the questions First, unfortunately, I think the people who are concerned or the critics are right that between automation, artificial intelligence, digitization, we would destroy 20 to 40 percent of the jobs as we know them today. Everyone from perhaps truck drivers to the farmers to even the radiologists uh, on it. And uh, if you're going to really grow the job market, uh, if large companies 40% of large companies will also disappear. And when I first started saying that, people said, no, I don't think so. It might be too conservative a number now over the next decade. It means that startups and small companies getting bigger will be the job engine for India, U.S., and for Europe. And I think most people now agree upon that. So if you have 1.2 million people entering the workforce every month in India, and you have a certain amount of jobs also being destroyed that will not come back, you've got to generate jobs in the 1.5, 1.6 million range to really do that. That's why India has to be a startup nation. This is where I think your prime minister has absolutely the right vision and the strategy. Uh, I've met every, every leader in the world for 35 years, and he is among the top three I've ever seen in my life. His ability to get a vision and strategy and say, here's where we're trying to go, to inspire hope and then take hope to possible than probable. And with the digital India and the ability to say, here's what we can do with one segment such as startups and understanding it can't be just in six cities where the majority of venture capital goes. It has to be in all 29 states. And it is that inclusiveness, uh, not just by uh, geography, uh, but also in terms of caste, in terms of gender, yeah. that I think this prime minister is the example for the rest of the world. So to play a small role in trying to help that happen and to be the startup ambassador perhaps for the world, but especially for India, U.S. and France, uh, is very exciting. And I'm trying to change the world one more time in my way. And just like the Internet changed the world and Cisco led the way there, to play a role in the startups and make it inclusive across a country like India and to truly partner between the U.S. and India is, is a dream that I have. You were talking about the Indian scenario. Definitely earlier what we saw was that during the earlier regimes there was no set agenda for the startups as it's being taken up now in the, in the current regime. Yes. But my question to you is yes. that India needs about one million jobs per month if you look at the, the, the population. Okay. So are all these jobs going to come through the startup? I mean, how do you really see the startup culture evolving in India? The answer to your question, if I may use a couple examples, is yes. And uh, it has to be inclusive. It can't be where 90% of your venture capital, in other words, money being invested in startups, only goes in six cities. We have 29 states where the average state population might be 50 million. We have to go across all 29. It's the exact same issue in the U.S. It can't be just Silicon Valley and New York. It's got to be across all 50 states. And it is the exact same issue, the France state, where the majority of its investment is in Paris. And France is the last place you would have located jobs just five or six years ago. And it was not creative, not a good place to do business or startups. And just four years, it's become the startup engine for Europe. The number of startups are up from 140 venture capital backed per uh, year to 743 the French. Now the exciting thing about India is so many of the people in this country, uh, IITs or great incubation area, uh, grasp that it's not only about education but it's also about startups and I see this country becoming a startup engine for the future and even in the US out of the 18 companies I've invested in over 60 percent of the founders are first or second generation Americans. 
from India. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for the talent in this country, and I think we, we need to take the Prime Minister's vision of a digital India, of which startups, education, healthcare, and the environment all feed toward a common uh, end goal of employment uh, across all geographies, across all genders, and across all castes. I was seeing a couple of your interviews on various uh, channels, and uh, you've always said that one should reach U.S. and compete with the U.S. market. Why have you always been an advocate of the U.S. market when it comes to promoting the, the startup culture? Well, I think it's very important, and let's use the examples in India, and I have two that I'm very proud of, and they're early stage, and, and uh, they have, you know, when I look at startups, I look at a market transition with a technology transition. I look for a visionary potential CEO who knows what she knows or he knows and knows what they don't, who wants to be coached. One that my customers say, you ought to look at this company, and one that has the chance to be the number one and number two. In India, the startup community, all companies will become a technology or digital company, regardless if you're in healthcare, manufacturing, consultants, government, etc. So it's the two combined which creates a tremendous opportunity. But as you really think about where this is going, uh, business to consumer in India is doing very well. At first, the startups were uh, U.S. lookalikes, but the market here is so large. Uh, with 1.3 billion people, uh, that you're now seeing them start to re-innovate. India's moved from a slow follower to a fast, innovative leader. Who would have thought five years ago? And the reason that I talked about you, you startups in India coming to the U.S. are more the business-to-business -business startups. Uh, there have been very few successful high-tech business-to-business uh, -business startups blossom just in India alone. So many people believe, including myself, that you've got to bring them to the U.S. It doesn't mean the company has to move, yeah. but you've got to come to the U.S. market where it is unbelievably competitive. So you hone your skills here in India. Uh, you learn how your product can really differentiate, such as Lucidius has done with Saket Modi, such as Unifor has done uh, very, very well uh, with uh, Umesh Sanjez. And uh, both of them are going to 300%, by the way. Right. But to but really just, be successful, they had right. to move to the U.S. and challenge in the U.S. market. You gave me the example of Lucidius and Unifor, which of course are Indian uh, startups which yes. made uh, big after reaching the U.S. market. But uh, we've seen that there is a certain kind of a hiccup when it comes to the Indian startups going global. So what, according to you, are the real challenges which the startups here are facing? And when you look at it from, from the point of view of United States, what do you think are the major problems? Well, I think there are more opportunities than problems. Your education system is amazing. Uh, your top uh, CEOs, often with a technical background, are very competitive on a global basis, but there aren't the role models to learn from. And one of the things I'm trying to do is coach young companies on how they scale. Okay. I bought 180 companies when I was at Cisco, uh, 12 of them for over a billion dollars. I've seen what requires a company to be successful. I've made every mistake there is to make. And so what I try to do is help these companies grow and skill to become a mentor for them. Yeah. And that's often what the venture capitalists ask me to do too. They say, John, we don't compete with you, but can you come in and help my company really grow and scale? And I love coaching young CEOs. I get, I get my pick of the litter. Uh, I get to pick almost any startup in the world, and I'm not sure I deserve that, but that's what's being offered. And then I get a chance to be a proud parent or grandparent and really let them grow and to give them advice. And then on Friday evening, I say, here's my advice. I know it's going to be tough. Call me on Monday, let me know how it goes, and I go have a bourbon and ginger ale. But John, uh, India is a budding startup nation. Yes. Lots of things are in process as far as policies are concerned, capital uh, uh, disbursement is concerned, yes. and there are a lot of youngsters who are interested in becoming entrepreneurs. Yes. Uh, what are you, through this interview, when people are going to watch this interview, I'm sure yes. there'll be many entrepreneurs in India who will look at what you're going to say. Yes. And my, what my question to you is that what do you look for in a startup? so that you can connect them to the Fortune 500 companies. Gotcha. And it's the same is true also for a startup that's going to go to the consumer. Uh, the first thing I look for in a startup is they've got a market transition. Okay. Uh, that means a business model change, either in healthcare or transportation like Uber or retail like an Amazon, yeah. combined with technology. The second thing I look for is a young CEO who she or he 
uh, knows what they know, knows what they doesn't, uh, they don't know, and wicked smart. There's no substitute for that. Then I look for who are their flagship customers that they're able to hold out as an example, okay. using uh, uh, the example of Lucidius, the Bombay Stock Exchange, or the top manufacturing or the top bank or the top government, using the example of Unifor, who are their top customers and what do they think about them. And then I look to see if they have a chance to be one or two in their industry. Being number 20 in a fast growth industry, you won't survive. So they do, they have the differentiation uh, within it. And then I look for the quality of their team, the quality of their investors. So it's a replicatable innovation playbook that allows you to move with tremendous speed. Very similar to what I did at Cisco, where we wrote the playbook, the innovation playbook for doing acquisitions. I think everyone in the world would say we are the best there is in technology about doing the acquisitions. Out of the 180 we did, probably two-thirds were successful, where 90% normally fail in a market. But it wasn't that we were smarter or worked harder, it was we developed what were the criteria we wanted to do for acquisitions, just like the criteria outlined for what you want to do in terms of successful startups. But when, you know, there's an evolving uh, startup culture, the biggest question which comes to mind is that if the startups will be the order of the day, yes. what is going to happen to the large companies which are already existing? What happens to them? The number one thing when I coach a young CEO or a Fortune 100 CEO, a number of which I do coach in the U.S., uh, the CEO's job is four things. Strategy and vision for the company, to develop, retain, recruit, and change the leadership team to implement that strategy and vision, culture and communications. And communication is extremely important. But what most young CEOs miss is how important culture is. Okay. Culture is what you're about. You never have a great company without a very strong culture. You may or may not like it. So to your point, how do you coach these young companies on culture. And then the second element is how do you really get them to dream what is possible? How do you help them build the organization out? How do you help them to have no fear, yet realistic on the challenges that could occur? And that was one of the fun things about the Padma Awards, awards, which we'll talk about later. When I watched every award recipient, first I was humbled by them. It didn't matter if they were a social worker or a doctor uh, or an artist or a musician they took great pride in taking what they did well and teaching others how to do it and to scale. That's what I love. I, I consider myself a teacher more than anything else in terms of the direction. And to a point you raised earlier, that's often what is missing here. They're having, you've got tremendous large consultancy organizations, but the number of startups that have really scaled over the last couple of decades, we're just now seeing them start to take off in India. So those are the type of things that I look at in a replicatable playbook, if you will, to how to go after it. So which means that if the larger companies have to grow alongside with the startups, they will have to hold hands, they will have to partner together, that's where the actual growth will be. You, you've, uh, I think, restated that the exact right way. It used to be that large companies in India uh, or Europe, and to a large extent even in the U.S., would not partner with small companies. The risk was too high, they felt they could innovate on their own. The large companies aren't going to be able to innovate with the speed. Your top students here in India out of the IITs, they no longer want to go to government or the big companies. They want to go to the startups. And so if your talent is going to the startups and they can move with the speed and the creativity, then large companies for the first time have to not just do business with startups, they have to actually partner with them in a very unique way. That's been the major change in the last two years. Large companies before, even in the U.S., wouldn't partner. They'd test it with a small startup. Now you have a very innovative company like Boeing partnering with a Spark Cognition, 200 people, artificial intelligence, 50-50 joint venture to outline the future of uh, aviation for unmanned uh, technology across the U.S. Uh, you suddenly have a rise in making interfaces to a company called ASAP, which is still in stealth mode, uh, about how do you dramatically change your company way you interface to your customers through artificial intelligence, et cetera. So that's been what is different in the business world where many of the established companies, per your question, are suddenly looking to startups as innovation engines and how they bring that startup culture into their company because the CEOs know they have to change. But often uh, you've said that India is almost on the cusp of uh, you know, having the next Silicon Valley and probably yes, Silicon yes. Valley could be displaced soon. How soon do you see that happening? I think it's not a question of a zero-sum game. I think the exciting thing is startups, regardless of where you are in the world, 
uh, whether you're in France or Germany or the U.S. or India or uh, the Middle East or Africa or China. It's how do you evolve? And I think the countries who really outline a clear vision of where you want to go and execute off of that are going to be the ones that win. Now, interestingly enough, going back to India, I think your prime minister's vision is the best there is in the world. I've met every leader, and as I said earlier, he's in the top three. But he takes a vision and then is able to break it into the components and then keep focus on a uh, digital India, a uh, manufacturing India, a uh, environmentally sound India, startup India, a smart city India, and brings all the parts together toward an outcome. Coming to uh, the U.S.-Indo uh, relationship uh, and especially talking in context with this uh, strategic partnership forum which is doing a lot to promote the startup ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the Indo-U.S. ties uh, developing in, in the framework of this uh, forum? Well, the exciting part to me is that I believe the relationship for the U.S., the most important country in the world strategic partner-wise, needs to be India. And I'd argue for India, the most strategic, important partner they have needs to be the U.S. And I think by partnering not in an old world way and talking about trade and how companies make money, but in a new world way about how do you create jobs together, uh, how do you incorporate startups, how do you bring innovation to life, how do you do this in an inclusive fashion, both by geography, by gender, uh, as we talked about earlier, that's what the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum is about. And its ability to dream what could occur between our two countries and then be able to work with government and business leaders and academics about how do we make this happen and have the courage to set audacious goals uh, about how many jobs can we create and how can we do this across the entire country and how do we educate the citizens both in the U.S. and India of the importance of our partnership and how that will benefit each of those. Uh, perhaps it's a dream that people will say or it's, it's not possible, but uh, while I have a lot of weaknesses in life, most of the, pr the predictions I've made on connecting the dots because of the experience I've already seen the movie is the ability to say, here's the outcome. That's what dyslexia forces you to do, to go A, B, Z, and to get people around you can say, how do we fill in the pieces as we go? Uh, I think looking back 10 years from now, the relationship between our two countries will have, be the model for the rest of the world. And uh, that doesn't mean there won't be bumps along the way and at times one side gets irritated with the other. That's part of a partnership. But if we, as long as we keep in mind how do both countries win, how the citizens win in each other way, how do we do this in an inclusive fashion uh, for all the geographies, I think this will be the example for the world. Absolutely. And uh, when you talk about thinking global and, you know, taking the Indian startups uh, yes. to America, and you've always said that if you can compete in U.S., you can compete anywhere. anywhere. That's what all your interviews have said, yes. uh, invariably. But, uh, you know, what about barriers like H-1B visas yeah. when it comes from the U.S. government? And how does one then deal with barriers like these? Because they are, are a big stumbling block then. Well, you, first you need to know, in my opinion, and I'm now speaking for John Chambers, JC2, uh, Chairman of the U.S. India Strategic Partnership Forum, I'm a huge believer in immigration. And I think trying to attract the best and the brightest in the world to the U.S. is what has made our nation a great nation. And I think we need to continue to do that at a tremendous, tremendous speed. Uh, that when we uh, have barriers to that, uh, I think we've got to say, how do we knock those down? And how do you do it uh, to the point of realizing that 40% of the startups in the U.S. are uh, of Indian origin uh, in Silicon Valley alone, and they create a huge number of jobs there. I think also educating people throughout the country on why that is in their best interest and how do you do it in a true win-win way uh, for each country. So I'm a, a believer, strong believer, in structured or, uh, immigration and uh, quality of leaders. And I'm also a huge believer in many of the people that have come out of the IITs, et cetera, that come to start companies in America, then come back to India as well. And I think it is that type of partnership that the future uh, holds for both of us. Uh, I think educating people on why that's important, not just on H-1B visas, but in general. To the point that you raised indirectly, France, as an example, and they have become the startup nation in Europe, uh, is almost, if you've got a, a high education uh, in engineering or technology, 
It's an automatic stamp come to our country. We want you here. So I think the future is about talent. I don't think any one geography has a monopoly on that. As the popular saying goes that, you know, politics is always uh, an instrument of uh, socio-economic change in the society. Yes. And uh, in India, elections are around the corner. Mm -hmm. It's going to be my last question to you. What do the political parties really need to focus on when you talk about uh, a startup culture, promoting a startup culture, promoting an entrepreneurial spirit? Because uh, very soon the political parties will come out with their manifestos as mm -hmm. exactly what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. So how should they really focus as far as the startups are concerned? And if I can draw that parallel to the U.S., uh, I all my career, even though I'm a moderate Republican, which is kind of in danger in the U.S., especially in California, I've always got along with and the Democrats. And you don't Democrats. have a problem saying this. No, I don't have any problem <laughs> saying that. But I get along with the Democrats and the Republicans. You know, and I get along very well with Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker in the House. I get along very well with Kevin McCarthy, uh, the uh, uh, leader from the Republican side in the House. John McCain was my idol before he, he died, and I get along with Chuck Schumer. So I tend to separate politics from results. And I always try to figure out who can outline the right vision to change the country and make it inclusive. And so in this country, as an example, it's up to the people in India to determine who their future will be. But as I said earlier, I'm hard pressed to say I've ever seen a better leader than your prime minister. And somebody who can outline a vision and a strategy and inspire the hope and the possibility and then probability of execution and hold himself to a level of accountability to drive this through. He is respected around the world, and I talk to all the other world leaders. Uh, he, when, he, when he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the president of the U.S. or key leader out of Europe or China or Pakistan, he represents the country in an amazing way. But most important, he has a vision and strategy, which you can't argue with. It's the number one economy in the world, growing 7 to 10 percent. India used to have such a bad image in terms of ease of doing business, it's improved more than any other country in the world, and we still have a ways to go. And startups, there were so many hurdles in front of startups, and they've knocked them down. And the courage on demonetization, I'm glad he didn't ask me, because I'm not sure I would have had the courage to say do it, but it was absolutely the right move for digitizing the country. And the goods and services tax, the angel tax fixing for startups, uh, I see such a progressive vision of the future here in India, and uh, as I said, I, I think it is the best strategy and implementation in the world. But it's up to the citizens of the country to decide their future, uh, but this is one of the top three leaders I've ever met in my life. I think his vision for a India inclusive across all geographies, gender, caste, is amazing, and that's perhaps what I learned in the Padma Awards when I watched my peers and how good they were. And it wasn't just the past India and the achievements, uh, it's the present, but it's the hope for the future and the ability to dream together. It's really heartening to hear from a person like John Chambers that India is on the right track. And it was uh, really lovely uh, uh, talking with you, uh, a great inspirational talk as well. Thank you so much it was for a coming pleasure. on the program. The honor was mine. So that's it on this episode of To The Point. See you next time with another personality. Goodbye and thanks for your time.